gonna start off with the student recognitions. So just wanted to thank everyone for coming out tonight and just wanna thank all the students for all their hard work and excellence. We have and are gonna start with our Halatini Students of the Month. And so when we call your name, please come down and be recognized by the group. And I'm gonna hand it over to President Tills. Thank you so much, um, Superintendent Hauser. Thank you all for um, being here this evening. Um, it's always exciting to recognize our students. So without further ado, um, Bristol Clifton of Latchley Middle School. Woo! BMS has selected Bristol Clifton as the 8th grade Hallett City Student of the Month. We would like to recognize Bristol for her dedication to her education and extracurricular activities. Bristol is self-motivated, working hard in every class, being prepared, and embracing challenges. She is kind and compassionate, helping classmates and teachers when needed. Bristol is an asset to the groups and teams that she belongs to. She is a critical thinker who innovates to solve problems. Ethan Clark of Sika High School. But Ethan consistently demonstrates the core principles of Hallett Scene, responsibility, compassion, and engagement. Throughout his first year and a half at SHS, Ethan has demonstrated strong academic skills, making the honor roll every semester. Ethan is an active member of the SHS community participating in basketball and track and field, as well as a recent inductee into the National Honor Society. He always has a smile on his face and is a friend to all. Ethan is a great role model, and SHS is proud to have him as one of, his, as one of our students. Rosie is a fifth grade peacemaker and, and supports second grade students at, on the playground. She has been a leader in kindness at school since entering kindergarten. She regularly volunteers to help other students and to offer solutions to help staff for improving the school climate. For two years in a row, she has written and performed puppet shows to deliver the Ki Kushihin's weekly social-emotional learning session. Rosie is the true embodiment of values of Howlett City. It is so wonderful to hear that Rosie has been selected for the Howlett City Student of the Month. Rosie puts an incredible amount of work, thought, and effort into not only her school activities, but also numerous activities she participates in outside the school. She is a wonderful friend and peer and is a leader that other students enjoy working with and being around. As her teacher, she is such a joy to have in the classroom and work hard and dedication to always being her best self and definitely worth rewarding. Way to go, Rosie. <laughs> Next is for Baranoff Elementary School, we have Macy Webb. All right, she's not here, but I'll, I'll read this out. Macy Webb has been selected as the Hoflet Sini student at Baranoff because she is willing to take a challenge or to take a challenge to help our school community. She is extremely clever, an excellent friend, and we appreciate her playful nod to Wednesday. Being so helpful comes naturally to her and inspires others at school to be the best version of themselves. Our 
student of the month for Pacific High School is Xandra Gray Young. Xandra is a senior this year and has been working incredibly hard to finish up her graduation requirements. Xandra is a student representative this week at the ACES Project Fair, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, where she will present a science project about salmon berries. She was recently accepted to University of Alaska Fairbanks and plans to pursue a degree in social work. to recognize our amazing state-winning DDF team. So um, we're going to read off names, and I'm kind of like debating reading off the names or just saying, come on down. Everyone that's in DDF is going to be recognized tonight. Come on down. We're going to read names off as we're going through, and then as we go through, we can go ahead and clap and applaud and recognize for seven, is that right? Seven times state champions. So we're going to go, yeah, I know that was really so, uh, first off, Rita Christensen. I got that out. Christensen. Oh, yeah, everybody coming up. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. So, where's Rita? Rita? Oh, Rita's not here. Okay. Rihanna Bergman. Not here. All right. I was going to say, Felix, you got to get a beer, too. Come on now. My account. Where's my account? Jameson, done. No. <laughs> All right, that's it. I'll sit down. I'm going to call you up in that case. Sally Everson. <laughs> I'm not, uh, no, are these people real now? Are you guys just playing with me here? Ben Hedrick. Nope. <laughs> we still can recognize him now. Come on. Yeah. sharing that I'd like to give the coaches just a little bit to talk about the students and the performance and just how wonderful the seven time champions are. So we're going to start right here. Well, what I really enjoyed is that the whole sport of BDF is a very kind sport. Even though we're from different schools and different parts of Alaska, we still come together to play, do all the same thing and work together as a team, as our own teams. And even when we're up against each other, we're still very kind to each other, and it's just a very fun sport. I personally really like traveling. Um, I don't travel very much with my family, so I get to see like all the various towns, the other towns in Alaska, um, and so that's really fun, and seeing other people's schools. Uh, I enjoyed getting first place in duet with Aiden, <laughs> it was pretty fun, 
and then getting ready for nationals with Francis come the summer. Um, what I really liked about joining DDF was that it was a very welcoming atmosphere. When I first walked in, I had no idea what I was doing. And then someone, Rita, walked up to me and said, hey, you want to join our Reader's Theater? And I said yes, and then it all started from there. So it was a very welcoming atmosphere, and I really liked that about DDF when I first came by. Yeah, I mean, my answer's pretty much already been said. DDF's just an awesome atmosphere. You know, everybody's here to support each other, and uh, yeah, I, this has been my favorite high school experience. <laughs> Hi. Um, I don't know. I think that for this technically being my first year of DDF, it's been a super great experience and I've got to make tons of new friends. I think that's been my favorite part this year. Uh, I think that making uh, drama and debate competitive is really interesting as it's a bit different from like uh, sports. You can't really gauge based on like I don't know, there's just more to judge off of, I'd say. And that's really interesting. It's more, uh, uh, I mean, you just gotta put a lot of effort into it. Um, I really um, appreciate the um, learning experiences uh, I was able to get through DDF, not only just learning through watching other people's performances and seeing what I can do to improve my future performances, but also improving general life skills, like public speaking and standing in front of an audience. Um, and speaking extemporaneously. <laughs> uh, I like being able to put together competitive pieces with people that I love and care about, uh, like Sam, my duo partner, who I'm going to nationals with for our duo interpretation, and also my debate partner, Jameson, uh, who now we want to stay in debate two years in a row. So being able to work with people that I care about and be successful is my favorite part. Um. Christian and I are both um, Sika High alums um, and alums of the DDF program, so it's really rewarding to be able to come back and to you know be on the other on the other side as coaches. Um, and DDF just always has the best kids. You guys are always amazing to work with and just really wonderful, full, rich young adults. And it just it's such a it's it's such a blessing to have you guys in our lives and to get to be a part of this activity that kind of brings us all together. Um, and I just also really want to say people ask all the time like seven years in a row, how do you manage that? Um, we attribute a lot of that to the support that we have in this community, the awareness of DDF, the support of the faculty and at Sitka High School, the administration, of you know making sure that we have spaces and that we have resources and that kids know about our program and that they're funneled to us. All of that makes a huge difference in the success and the longevity of our program. So thank you to the community and thank you to the Sitka School District. I just want to say it's been a true blessing to get to do this activity um, with all the kids that I've done this with over the years. Um, I never thought I'd get to be a DDF coach. It was never on my radar. And then seven years later, here I am, and we're just having a great time. And really, it's a, such a positive experience for me. And it seems to be a positive experience for all the kids. And um, it's very rewarding. But the, the best part is just getting to like transfer some fun knowledge that Amy and I have gathered over the years and get to funnel it into young people that are excited about this activity. And uh, like some of the kids said, this is one of the least toxic competitive atmospheres you'll find in any kind of after school activity. Uh, all the schools, as much as it is a competition, everybody supports everybody. Everybody wants to see everybody succeed. It's, it's a really fun atmosphere. There's, there's always a little bit of competitiveness, um, but uh, everybody's very supportive and at the state level, including that, um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. And all the coaches across the state do a, a lot of hard work to kind of make sure this activity uh, stands head and shoulders above a lot of other things and um, takes a priority. And so we, uh, Amy and I are just very uh, happy to get to do this and we appreciate all the hard work from all the kids. So. Uh, let's get everybody let's get them a nice picture. All right, how about one more round of applause for our good way of students. Congratulations. Yes, that is the best part of this meeting, I feel. Thank you all for being here this evening.
The call this meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. Let's start with the flag suit. Please state their full name for the record prior to speaking. 
Are there any persons to be heard concerning items that are on the agenda this evening? Please come down. All right, seeing none. Moving on to item eight, special reports, government to government. Are there any government to government reports? From the city? From the tribe? Seeing none. Moving on to item nine, school highlights. Keep pushing in and say high school. start talking before it begins um, just that some things that are going on right now so if you pass molar field on your way in um, you see our baseball tournament has started um, and we have um, lots of teams here including Petersburg, North Pole, um, Palmer, um, Thunder Mountain, Juno Douglas, um, and Ketchikan all in town. Um, we were talking at our faculty meeting this morning um, about student activities. Our clubs and activities right now for spring. Can you put that first slide? Thank you. Um, we looked at, we have over 70% of our current students are actively involved in a spring club or activity, which is incredible. And so what we're talking this morning is how we can get that last 30% into something right now. That doesn't mean they didn't do something earlier in the year. But there's a lot going on. So currently we have our baseball tournament going on. Softball played their first home games last weekend. Their tournament's coming up next weekend. Track and field left this morning to go down to Seattle and compete. Next week is Region 5 Music Festival. Um, a, a great tidbit I wanted to share is that we have started a Filipino American club. And that club currently has 32 members. Um, so it's been very popular. Um, I think the first meeting we got everybody there with pants it and then after that they just keep coming back. So really popular, nice club. And then um, our school play is also coming up um, here in May. So there's a lot of things and I'll go over some um, upcoming dates um, with you in, in just a bit. I know we just celebrated our DBF team and that was incredible. And a lot of those same faces you'll see in this group, but this just happened this past weekend is mock trial and this is a little less known um, because it's not an ASA sanctioned event. Um, this is actually an event um, sponsored by the Young Lawyers um, section that's of the Anchorage Bar Association. And so we actually sent two complete teams up and they finished first and third. Very close to being going head to head in the championship. So um, Howard Wayne and Ashley Nessler took the two groups up and have coached them along the way with um, lots of help um, from um, Judge Pate and then also Brian Hansen and they've worked and this is also a super successful group um, historically. But um, so I just want to quickly recognize the team members. Um, so the our, of our first Sitka number one team was Jameson Dunn, Felix Myers, Isabel Schmetzer, Sam McLaughlin, Kelsey Simic, and Zoe Trapton. And Zoe was actually named the top witness of the tournament. And then of Sitka team number two that finished third. A um, little controversial. We kind of felt like they should have finished second, but the other teams were kind of on their home turf. But that was Dimitri Bennett, Francis Myers, who was also the top attorney of the tournament, 
Aiden Lafrenet, Dan Majeski, Liam Laburn, and Sally Everson. And again, they were coached by Howard Wayne and Ashley Nestler. So congratulations um, to their championship. So uh, upcoming next week, uh, Region 5 Music Festival, we are sending 66 students to Ketchikan on the ferry, the ferry trip, the 24-hour ferry trip there and back will be, I'm sure, a fun time for all. That's the one where there's no floor space and everyone's sleeping everywhere. But we also had uh, a pre-festival concert last night in the pack, and so a couple pictures from that, um, all of our uh, different music groups played last night and I just want to give a shout out to Mr. Hames is has just done a phenomenal job. He's stepped right in and to see the improvement from the beginning of the year till now is is really amazing and he's worked really hard at that and you can tell so just give kudos to that program. Um, a few things that are kind of going on right now so we're starting to put up our senior spotlights and this is where the students kind of tell us what their next step is, where they're planning to go, and, and we start posting those around school so all the students can see all of their options. And then we have lots of stuff coming up, so we're about to do our eighth grade visit up to Sitka High. We do an open house for uh, the eighth graders and their families. We have prom coming, senior awards night, um, graduation, so we always kind of joke that right after spring break, you snap your fingers in, it's summer. But you know, you're at something the entire time. So lots of fun stuff. And then wrapping up after school is out. We're actually hosting the state baseball tournament this year at Moeller. So that'll be super exciting. Um, it'd be a great time to come out and watch um, good for the community and for our team. So, um, so you, you all had approved the, the trip to Costa Rica and that did happen. So our marine biology and Spanish four students. So we had 16 students go with um, two, the two teachers. So Ms. Starbuck and Ms. Golden took them. Um, the reports back all the way around was that everyone was exhausted because their days were super long beginning to end, but that it was a great mix of science and culture and language. And so they did all sorts of fun things. You see them there, but they did wildlife viewing and rafting and zip lining. They went on a night hike, they went to hot springs, and then they did beach cleanups, snorkeling, just all sorts of things um, the whole time. So and that was a really good opportunity. And it was interesting because most of the students had not ever left the country before, so this was their first international excursion. But uh, by all reports, everything went very well. So that was great. Thank you for allowing that to happen. Um, so we just hosted the job fair um, at Sika High, and this was new. We started this last year. So we, our big event in the fall is the college and career fair, and then in the spring now is the job fair. And actually at our job fair, we had over 36 businesses there recruiting, and everything you could imagine from um, you know, summer attendants to customer service agents to tour guides, the Navy was there, line service technicians, we had some unions there, just across the board. And this is something that um, citywide, I think we have seen that finding employees is an issue, and I think that we can help solve that issue with some good young kids um, that are ready and willing to, to go and start earning some money. So that was a, a great opportunity. And then I just want to share a little bit with you about some things that are going on in our classrooms. So this is a very um, interesting and unique opportunity to involve some culture and then incorporate it into our math classes. So in a project that actually first started through Nancy Douglas, um, but we worked with Sea Alaska, and our, our math teachers have now gone over to trainings twice, and then learning about how weaving can be integrated into the math classroom. So uh, this year, our geometry classes plus our math skills class um, all participated in this. And um, so the six different math classes and all of our math teachers were involved. Um, just like had some good quotes from students. So one student said, it made me feel good when I got to see the start of a pattern forming. And then at the end, I saw the pattern and it 
made it look so cool. Um, and, and so th they got to learn all different aspects and um, how everything is intertwined and interrelated and how math kind of lives in everything. So um, really good experience. Everyone had um, very positive things to say. And um, Mr. Skolka helped a lot um, in coordinating and making sure that everything went well. So that was a lot of fun. And then I also just want to mention, I, I don't know if you have seen or heard about the young well that passed that is actually washed up on cruise off, but we are currently, fingers crossed, working with some partners to hopefully have a well ar re-articulation project. So it's probably about a year and a half project, and I'm sure when Ms. Golden talks in a little bit, you could ask her some more detailed questions, but our hope fingers crossed, is that we can re-articulate the bones to this whale. It's a 27-foot structure, and that we can hang it in Sikai. And the Science Center is going to help support some of the education pieces. UAS, hopefully, is going to help provide some of the space to do some of the work that it takes. But uh, this is something that I think the entire community can be involved in, and students can see it from the start of the project to the end of the project, and then hopefully we can display it forever. Really good opportunity. And then last but not least, it's National Assistant Principals Week. And so it also happens to be Mr. McCarty's birthday today. And so I told him as his present that he could have the night off and have dinner with his family. So, but I, I don't want to fail to recognize that he plays a critical role in our building. Um, he's our building test coordinator and we just finished AK Star testing and all of his efforts are greatly appreciated. I just want to thank you for that wonderful report. Um, I told Mr. Hauser tonight my oldest daughter is, is quite set on going to a particular high school, but after hearing about the mock trial and BBF um, and going to those events, she's pretty swayed to attend Sakai School, so it would be nice to that. All right. Thank you again, and uh, um, I hope everything with the whale um, project goes yeah. accordingly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Right. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of the fun things going on at Heat. <clears throat> we'll get started. That picture was actually taken by Miss Barry uh, a couple weeks ago. Pretty impressive. Um, so first thing I want to talk about and share is just <clears throat> music at KGH. Uh, March 7th, I believe, we had our spring um, fifth grade band concert, and it's just, it's always a fun time of year to hear uh, the improvement that the kids have made um, <clears throat> throughout the year and all the hard work that they've put in, and it's, I think they get a lot of life lessons out of that. Also, Miss Miss uh, Brant Ferguson holds them to, to task, uh, and all their hard work and practice and, and perseverance really um, pays off, and they can see that, wow, if we put some time and effort in, uh, we do improve, and, and I think that can translate to other areas of their life as well. All right, so um, this week was week five of Girls on the Run, and uh, the coaching staff uh, has been very busy with their lessons, and they always integrate uh, social emotional learning throughout um, their program, and this week uh, the, the runners were talking about uh, that there are no bad emotions, that they're just emotions that can make us feel comfortable or uncomfortable. And so they played, had an activity where they uh, got new partners and they were um, you know, using emotion cards so that they were you know, shocked, lonely, brave, and uh, they were able to connect this lesson with the Southeast traditional tribal values of this week, uh, live in peace and harmony, and to be strong and have courage, which was really exciting um, to see. And last weekend they had their family practice and they had uh, several of the families attend and come join for a uh, running practice um, event. 
I'm excited to see Miss Barry run the 5K on May 13th <laughs> with the girls, right? Uh, next up, I think we have our Geography Bee uh, that recently took place. And the National Geography Bee no longer exists, uh, but Ms. Karsunke and Ms. Gagner have kind of uh, carried on the tradition and created more of a um, local type of Geography Bee um, and put that together for our fourth and fifth graders each year so that they can continue to compete and have this uh, enriching event take place. So we really appreciate their extra time and efforts uh, to make that happen. And uh, you can see our champion there, Renly Goodland, um, fourth grader from Ms. Chong's class, was our winner this year. So um, this week, uh, we've had uh, Mary Goddard as our artist in residence, um, collaborating with the second grade team to do a project on traditional Northwest coast form line shapes, which is also a part of the second grade uh, two and three dimensional um, geometry unit. Um, you can go to the next one as well. So she has been working with students to recognize form line shapes and learning how to carve into scratch board material, just like how she carves into her jewelry. So kids have been extremely excited about this. Um, and then this week they were doing, uh, making the larger versions of the form line shapes. And today they were able to make and put the shapes together in their own way to make their own creatures. Um, and so here we have um, an eagle and we have a meerkat. Um, let's see, I think. The, oh, the sloth is bottom left, and then the uh, red pin the top right. It was really amazing. There were all the all the groups of kids were in the NPR, completely engaged and so excited. And when we walked through, they had to tell you all. Of, they were so excited to tell you about the habitat and, and tell you a story about their creation. It was really really exciting. Um, other events in um, another second grade classroom. Um, these are some examples of some stop motion videos that students created as part of a collaborative project um, through design and video. So we'll watch those. Stephanie Peterson back in our building. Um, she retired a couple years ago, but can't stay away, which is lucky for us. Uh, and she's um, helping facilitate our GT program uh, this spring when the skim shoot is, is away. And uh, Stephanie came to me and said, hey, I want to do Project Fair again. And we hadn't had a Project Fair since before COVID. And so she put that together. Uh, and, and we didn't quite know what to expect as far as turnout um, because it's been two or three years uh, since it had taken place and I think we had 44 uh, projects uh, this year with students. Um, they set up in the NPR and we were able to share that uh, with uh, KGH classrooms and then parents were able to come uh, one evening. But just really fun uh, event and something uh, really neat that uh, students and their families could work on together. And then field trips. We have some opportunities for students uh, to go and experience things outside of the classroom. Uh, one of the highlights uh, that we got to do and was unique, we hadn't done this one before, uh, was go see a CERC performance. Uh, they reached out to us and we were able to go to their facility and we had a number of the performers were KGH students themselves, and they were able to see um, their peers and kind of their element um, performing uh, all of these circus events, and it was quite impressive. Uh, a lot of fun. I think the kids really enjoyed that. So third grade has been busy this week with scientists in the classroom. Um, today, specifically, the kids uh, were able to learn, well, they're studying volcanoes, and they uh, learned the difference cone and stratovolcanoes, and um, obviously talked about Mount Edgecum as well. Um, but today they got to label the different parts of volcano and learned about wind direction um, and how that affects the ash plumes. So there's a video on here where the students are looking at the wind direction, and so they did three different um, experiments where they had rice with a fan to see how those particles Jeez. carry. I wish you could hear them because they are, they're like, oh, they're so excited about it. 
Um, then they did salt with the fan, and then they did the flour with the fan, which is what you see here in the video. But they they were gauging, comparing how how the ash, the differences between how far that ash could travel, and uh, based on the ash's size. And you would, So um, we've also had the honor of having Mount Edgecombe students come to Keat and share their cultures with the fourth grade students in a station rotation. Um, each station had two to four Mount Edgecombe students um, sharing their different cultures. And they made a slideshow that included where they live in Alaska and what, where they're located and what type of subsistence food they have and clothing. We even had a few of the groups came in their regalia and shared some dances and uh, songs with the students. And um, even one of the stations um, demonstrated some Native youth and Olympic activities, which the kids were really excited to try on their own. <laughs> and then, as part of the, our family engagement activities, we had our Keep Family Night um, in January, and then we had the opportunity to kind of collaborate with Sika High School and uh, do our Keat Kids Night, which is our annual uh, basketball games. Uh, and so Keat uh, families were able to get into the event for free. Um, we always hand out some fun um, items for the kids, but the gym was packed. I don't know if anybody was up there that night, but just super fun and great to see all the families that turned out. Uh, and we had uh, the Sitka Skippers were able to perform at halftime, which is always entertaining. And uh, all, I believe, and we have Sitka Skippers here, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but all of the Sitka Skippers team members are uh, current or former KGH students, even the coaches uh, that get out there and perform, so that's kind of neat. A little fun fact, and the Skippers were able to go to Denver, Colorado, Oh, a couple weeks ago, I think, right after spring break, and uh, take part in the competition there as well. If you come into Keat um, any given day, there are so many activities going on. Um, we've had been really taking advantage of having community members, guest presenters come in. Um, We've had uh, one second grade classroom had a writing instruction um, from a guest presenter on riddles, um, which of course was really fun <laughs> to hear their samples and what they came up with. Um, other classrooms have been doing reader's theater and inviting other classes in to come be the audience. So it's a lot of practicing what it looks like to be an audience member and also giving the students an opportunity to perform for their peers. Um, and then also having a lot of different STEM projects in the classrooms. So we're seeing a lot, a lot of busy, busy kids. And a row key. I don't know if you had a chance to walk through our building, but um, it's pretty impressive, the bulletin boards and different things that uh, the teachers put together. Um, it's a lot of fun to see the art that goes up. And I've been doing my best uh, to kind of hide out and, and not be seen, but uh, the kids are doing a pretty good job of finding me. So um, lots going on at Keats, and I believe uh, you also get to see a highlight uh, for Miss Horton's class. She has her own highlight here coming up pretty soon. So they'll tell you more about that. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for you? <coughs> of course. I forgot to ask my, my question to Miss Lundick. Um, what, what is a challenge or something that you're facing at KGH? And is there anything you know, we can help with? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I should let this very I think one thing that's gotten a little bit better but still is a challenge is finding substitutes. That's huge. Um, today uh, we had three teachers out in no subs, I believe. And so it's just, you know, pulling uh, different staff from different areas and asking people to do a job that's not actually their job and, and those types of things. And <clears throat> I think just finding, um, I mean, of course, we we recognize them and we appreciate what they're doing, but it just always feels like it's not enough. Um, so that's, I, I think that's been the biggest theme this year for us and just working through that. Yeah. 
that's what I was going to say too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for those reports from Sika High School and KP Shaheen. Moving on to item 10, reports and presentations. Ms. Horton? to recognize students that are in the After School Media Club, but also that um, were celebrated and recognized at a couple of technology conferences here. And I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to uh, the, the Ms. Horton and the teacher and the leader of the Media Club to talk a little bit about kind of what they participated in. And we have some certificates that we want to make sure we hand out. So I'm going to turn it over to you. to ASCII, which is the Alaska Society for Technology and Education. Um, we have a couple winners. We had Owen work and Jason on a couple of photos. But they all had a great time and were successful in their, in their projects. So we're going to go ahead and read off some names. And I forgot my glasses. And when I read up your names, come on over, get your certificate, okay? And then we also have some presentation. We wanted to get the certificates uh, to them right away, though. So we're going to go ahead and... Right, right, yes, yes, thank you. So we already, we're going to start with Ella Branch as a member of the After School Media Club. So Ella, Iris Kendall. <laughs> Maddie McDivitt, where's Maddie? Congratulations, Maddie. Good job. Shut up, Mork. Oh, oh. He, had he had to step out. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and put there. Henry, what's her? Congratulations. <laughs> Annie White. And uh, Jace, Jace, where's Jace at? Jace is an Aussie Award winner for Sleepy Little Fishing Town, which was a uh, three photographs she put in, right? Is that right? Very nice. Congratulations, Jace. Oh, wait, 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 Jace. Congratulations. And is Owen here? And step out two. All right, well, Owen was also asked the award winner for Bob the Builder, which was a Lego stop action uh, video. And so I also want to take a moment to recognize Ms. Horton, who is and was recognized as a Microsoft Spotlight. How would you classify it? Just like teacher, educator, Microsoft Spotlight, you know, just recipients recognized she did a uh, presentation. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Microsoft Spotlight? And, Okay, this, this is what we like to do. We like to recognize and celebrate. The wonderful Cindy Duncan, she recommended me for the Microsoft Educator, or Innovative Educator Expert. So there's four of us in the state, and one of the leads um, heard about our club and um, asked her, 
spread it, and then the Microsoft asked us to do a highlight for all of all of all over. <laughs> so they got a chance to be asked to come and present on the amazing club that they're doing, all the cool things that the students are doing, and so. I just wanted to take the moment, and the board wanted to take a moment to not only recognize the students, but recognize Ms. Horton, too, for all the amazing things that they're doing. So how about another round of applause? We're going to get a picture. So we're going to get a picture of the students that are So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for all the hard work and excellence that you do in display. And the technology is amazing. And I will have that song stuck in my head um, probably for the next week and a half. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. So how about one more round of applause? Congratulations, everyone. Very busy right now, as Miss Lumbick pointed out. You know, we're we're doing a lot. Everyone's everyone's involved in something, uh, it seems. So uh, that's been a lot of fun. Music Fest next week is gonna be great. Uh, I wanted to take a moment uh, to talk about uh, a few weeks ago. I was in Juno for a meeting, and I had the opportunity to testify about a bill that's been introduced called a uh, House Bill 105, which is about uh, which is about sex education and uh, LGBTQ people in schools. And I want to take a moment to say that um, we as a community care very much about all of our students, um, no matter who they are. And uh, if there's still opportunities for public testimony on that bill, um, there will be another open uh, call period that you can call in. It's not been officially uh, announced when it's going to be, but if you have the time, um, it'd be great to call in. Or if you don't, uh, if you're not able to call in, please uh, send an email uh, about that bill. Please read the bill, uh, and um, because I think you know, as a community, this is something that we care about. We care about our kids and all of our kids, and so. Uh, yeah, so please stay up to date on that bill, uh, House Bill 105, uh, and yeah, stay involved for sure, because a lot of things are happening right now. I don't have anything, but I see Mary Szymanski in the back, and she missed the persons to be heard not on the agenda, so would you like me to read the flyer for you? Yeah. Or can yeah. read it? Or Come on up, Mary. It works. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize you guys were so quick. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you again for offering me this opportunity. And thank you all for everything you do. I know that it is probably often a thankless job, but as a mom of two kids in the school district, I sincerely appreciate everything that you do and every day you show up, 100%. Um, having said all that, I am doing my end too, where I have organized to have a um, Homer police officer, you might have seen these little flyers around town, uh, 
Ryan Browning is coming from Homer to present to Sitka at the Sheikha Kwan Nakahiti on Friday night at 6 o'clock to the entire community, um, teens 12 and up approximately, just to talk to his parents about what it's like to have kids in this day and age where kids have access to so much and are bombarded with so much at all times of the day, whether it be on their phone or um, if people still have PCs at home or anything. There's just really no getting away from it and how we can better support our youth is really what this conversation is about. Um, it has less to do with Ryan or me, it has everything to do with our youth and what they're um, exposed to and how they process it and who do they talk to when they're trying to query some of these difficult situations that they might have found themselves in or that they know someone else is in. Who's listening? And I want it to be all of us. I want it to be this entire community. I want every single person to pack the community house and hear this presentation on Friday, and then go home and have that conversation over and over and over with any young person that's in your life. Because even if your kid doesn't have a phone, or they're too young, or they're, you've chosen a different path, every kid is exposed to what's online. And if you don't know about Snapchat, or if you don't know about Instagram, or you don't know, you're behind the ball. And so this is just a good way to get a baseline for everyone in the community that this is what our kids are dealing with and how can we as adults in their life help shape them and making good decisions, making safe decisions and supporting them when they make a bad decision because we all do. So how are we that space for them to come to? And I think this is just the start of a lot of conversations I hope that um, not just our community has, but across the state. He's on his way to, on the way down to Sitka, he's um, stopping at the legislature to speak with them. So I see a whole movement happening because it is kind of like the wild, wild west, you know, where there's a lot going on and a lot of people don't know about it. But the more we talk about it, the more we know. And the more we know, the better parents, the better educators, the better people we can become. And our kids deserve that. So I respectfully ask all of you to come on Friday night, 6 o'clock, at the Shikokan Makahiti. And it'll be a frank conversation. And some of it might be uncomfortable, but I can guarantee you your kids have already seen it. So don't worry about that part. Um, but tell everybody. Tell all of your friends. Tell all of your coworkers. This is something we can really do for our kids. We can show up and vote for our kids just based upon us being in that building on Friday night. We can show them that we care and we're willing to learn and we're willing to get into this next phase of parenting with them as partners, not as people that don't understand. So thank you. Thank you for understanding me. I appreciate it. And thank you, Melanie. Thank you. So Friday, 6 p.m. at the 980. Mr. Gaylon? All right. Mr. Gilbert? Um, I have a, I do have a very light uh, report. Um, I'm excited about some of the uh, movement with the Finance with the BSA. I'm interested to hear about things like that. I'm sure Superintendent Hauser is going to have all the hopefully good news. We'll, wanna, we'll see. Uh, okay. I'll just wait for a minute. Okay. All right. Well, it, there's been movement and waiting to hear what that's happening. I, I am optimistic, I guess you say. Um, other than that, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you, Mr. Pickler. Um, for my report, um, it mainly has to do, um, it's going near Mr. Kepler's. Um, this last month has been um, busy with advocacy about raising the base student allocation, um, contacting our legislatures, and submitting testimonies on behalf of 
um, as a parent and as a personal person who lives in Sitka, I've seen how this affects our district. Um, it's been um, on my radar for quite some time, as I think all of ours, as the budget process rolls along. Um, as far as um, happenings, uh, we have had a full past month um, meeting together, um, trying to finalize and um, selecting a uh, interim superintendent once Mr. Hauser um, parts from us. I'm um, happy to um, report where we're at in that process, moving forward um, in that um, realm of the district's um, happenings. Um, and um, just trying to be a parent when I, when I can. Um, I do want to personally uh, um, praise Mr. Wayne and his whole group with the um, mock trial. I was able to spend some time with him at Sakai and go through the actual notes of the trial. And it was amazing to have my daughter attend. Um, ironically, I, I think I was in a meeting about um, the school district, um, but she did um, go and it was fun to hear her side of um, the whole trial process, so um, it was great to have that um, as a highlight in the past month. That's what I have. <coughs> update on the budget um, as we go through uh, you know we still are uh, in the uh, green with uh, the foundation funding coming in but I wanted to take this opportunity just to kind of speak to um, what Mr. Gabler was talking about um, on Monday in case you saw there was a house bill um, that went before amendment to uh, house bill on the operating budget that went before the um, uh, the house to have essentially a one-time funding equivalent to a $680 BSA increase, uh, which was about $175 million uh, that would go into place in FY24. And that was on Monday, that bill, uh, that amendment, I should say, passed 39 to one. Um, I just got word uh, that, um, that ultimately that uh, the one-time funding that was put in uh, on Monday, uh, the House voted today to delete that $174 million in one-time funding. And so at this time, that money is not in there. And so we are um, now, uh, we were planning on making some adjustments and looking at the, uh, you know, budgeting for um, our uh, work session. And we're making some adjustments to that right now. So. Just uh, because, like I said, Mr. Gabler brought that up, I wanted to just update the board. I have not had a chance to update you um, since uh, you know Monday when that um, had passed. And so, as of right now, that one-time funding that's put in um, has been uh, taken out uh, and voted to delete that one-time funding today. So that's just a quick update on uh, from you know the uh, state uh, foundation formula and FY24. So we'll work through that process, and again, we'll have the uh, budget work session on. March 13th, coming up next Thursday. Uh, with uh, transitioning out of that, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, enrollment. We have, you know, which is not unusual around this time of year, uh, enrollment's gone down a little bit, but really not that much. We're down to about 109 students uh, right now in the district, uh, which is a drop of three students from the last time we were here. And this is not unusual to see that, you know, as we get towards spring, students uh, transfer and move out. But, Still, you know, doing uh, good on that front. Just wanted to update everyone on enrollment, and then we'll transition into my superintendent update. I have just a couple of highlights. Also, I wanted to share, um, but uh, today's uh, you know focus will be on um, you know kind of our students, but also we're going to talk a little bit about the Alaska Reads Act. And so, if you've got a little bit about Alaska Reads Act, just want to update the um, board, but as well as just provide some more information for the community. So. 
But to start off with some highlights, we did hear from Seika High School and uh, Kiku Shaheen, uh, but wanted to highlight some of the other great things that are going on in our district. So Baranoff Elementary School had a very exciting and successful kindergarten sneak peek where a lot of the families came in, were able to take a tour of Baranoff and meet the staff. The kindergartners are actually starting to write sentences, and although not all the words are spelled correctly, and I can relate to that, um, they are using the skills that they're learning that they're learning to help them stretch out the sounds and kind of hear the whole words to spell the words. And so these are some of the uh, you know pictures that we have of students doing this, and this is also um, providing them the opportunity to independently express themselves in writing, which is that first step as they're going through. In first grade, they wrapped up their I Did a Read celebration with the pizza party. Uh, students spent the last few uh, books reading as many books as possible to pass through the checkpoints of the I Did a Read and to finish the I Did a Read. So families and friends joined in the culminating event. Uh, Mr. Braun's a little bit ahead. So, and then this is what you're seeing. We can let that run, but this is actually a really fun uh, activity and it's really the best ever kindness city. And so, Baranoff kindergartners and first graders actually practice their social skills by creating a tiny Sitka sized, or um, a tiny sized Sitka city in the gym. And they were going around and celebrating their SEL skills and talking about you know how they interact and of course you see some Kelso frog Kelso choices and how to support and help each other and so it was just really exciting to see them come together and build a little city where they were all getting along and working together to solve some problems and just work together at Blatchley. Blachi Middle School is actually starting the volleyball season, which is underway with over 50 girls participating on three teams. So uh, Coach Zadie Allen's actually pretty busy, uh, but also doing an amazing job. Uh, they also started AK Star testing and uh, it's underway right now. There have been just a couple of hiccups with technology, but nothing significant enough to affect the testing. So some pictures of the uh, volleyball team. Pacific High School had students participating in the school-wide herring camp. And this is a partnership with STA. So they're going through and, and working on and uh, talking about, you know, during the herring camp. And you can see some pictures there. But the students and staff also had a chance to go on the first camping trip since COVID. Uh, so they went to Samson Cabin and clearly had the most amazing looking s'mores ever. You can see that s'mores up there in the upper left corner. I'm actually jealous and really wanting s'mores right now, so that looks fantastic. But uh, they had a great time uh, going out and camping, and it was really exciting for them to do it. And just the, being able to get back, like I said, after the pandemic, and be able to experience and explore some of the opportunities um, that were unfortunately lost during the pandemic and during that time. So we're now going to transition, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about the Alaska Reads Act, um, and maybe answer some questions a little bit later about the Alaska Reads Act as we kind of are starting to work through and plan on the Alaska Reads Act. Um, and just as a reminder, the Alaska Reads Act that schools in Alaska have the new regulation from this act that is starting July 1 of this year. The Alaska Reads Act is intended to provide a comprehensive K-3 reading policy that is designed to improve reading outcomes, expand high quality pre-K opportunities, direct support and intervention services to low performing schools, uh, provide early identification of struggling readers, and it also requires intervention services for K-3 struggling readers. There are four program elements of the Alaska Reads Act. They are district reading improvement, department reading programs, pre-K and parents as teachers, and virtual education. It's important to note that the only element that's actually required by law, by the Alaska Reads Act law, is the district reading improvement element. Um, the other three elements of the Reads Act are voluntary. The Alaska Reads Act goes and supports the five shared priorities that are outlined in Alaska's education challenge, um, which really are to support all students who read at grade level by the end of third grade, increase career, technical, and culturally relevant education to meet student and workforce needs, close the achievement gap by ensuring equitable education, rigor and resources, preparing, attract, and retain effective educational professionals and improve the safety and well-being of students through school partnerships with families, communities, and tribes. So that is part of the Alaska Education Challenge and the READ Act really ties into supporting those um, five priorities. 
This is just a quick timeline. Uh, we have uh, been working through the timeline. As you can see, the regulations for the Alaska Read Act were being developed uh, between August and December. Uh, preparation has also been underway. Uh, State Board of Education uh, has gone through and looked at the regulations. Uh, in January, public comment uh, is ongoing, and they are anticipating the actual adoption of the regulations in April. And then there's just some resources that are available there. Uh, one of the things that's important as you look at some of the resources, there are going to be additional resources around the science of reading training. Uh, it is forthcoming, and we're just starting to see some of the training for our K3 teachers starting to um, be announced, and we've just started sharing that information out with some of our um, We've got Alaska Reads team that is working on coordinating the implementation across the district and supporting staff and um, you know working on curriculum and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, with Ms. Perry when she comes up in just a little bit. This is the district reading intervention overview uh, with the four components. So when we look at the district reading intervention overview, we are focusing on four main things. The MTSS framework, which provides a district-wide school K-3 plan around multi-tiered systems of support. And that multi-tiered system of support plan for the district and for schools need to be approved by the Department of Education. There is a literacy screener that is required as part of the Alaska Reads Act. Uh, there is a statewide screener for K-3 that has uh, been approved by the state. Um, and of course, any district that does not want to use the state um, screener can go through the waiver process. Uh, the city school district, the work that we're doing with the screener, we are going to be adopting uh, what is called M Class by Amplify. That is the new literacy screener that is recommended by the state. So we will not need to go through the screener waiver process. Um, another component of the Reads Intervention Overview is the individual uh, individual reading improvement plan, which is required for all students that um, have uh, are identified and uh, have a reading deficiency. And so that is for our tier two and tier three K3 students that are having those supports. And progression through K through three into fourth grade as students transition and if they're identified as having a reading deficiency on the spring screening and discussion and planning with parents. And so we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that as we go through. Um, but as we start looking at just the uh, literacy screener, as I said, um, the literacy screener is uh, the M class, which is Dibbles 8, and the district actually is using an earlier version of Dibbles, Dibbles and also uses Map Fluency, and so the transition for our K3 teachers um, using the literacy screener um, M class will be a little bit easier for us, but we will be having training that will be taking place and supporting staff on April 21st around the uh, M class literacy screener. This just talks a little bit about the screener components in a little more detail. As I said earlier, we are going to be using the state provided literacy screener in class um, and so that will be coming into place. So we'll have training on that and as you look at the breakdown of Amplify in class, the literacy screener, you can see that the red at risk and the kind of yellow some risk um, are the areas that we will be focusing on identifying for those students that will need tier two, tier three intervention support. Um, the students that score uh, below the 40th percentile uh, are going to be, uh, you know, uh, identified and um, seen as, uh, you know, needing those additional supports as we're going through and working with our students uh, to try to provide and meet the needs of uh, the students around literacy and reading. So as we talk about some of the um, reading intervention services, uh, as was spelled out in the Reads Act, the following are the reading intervention services that are going to be provided uh, through the Reads Act. Uh, and that includes innovation services offered to all K-3 students who exhibit a deficiency uh, through the M-Class literacy screener. Uh, parents with children who have a demonstrated reading deficiency will be communicated with immediately, so within 15 days, and will continue to be communicated with until they reach profic proficiency. Uh, uh, just as I said before, uh, deficient is identified and defined as below the 40th percentile on the Dibbles Amplified Literacy Screener. Um, the proficiency is uh, defined as above the 40th proficiency, uh, or sorry, proficiency is defined as above the 40th percentile, and those students below proficient will receive intensive reading instruction and interventions. Students in K-3 who have an identified reading uh, deficiency based on the statewide screener tool will be required to have an individual reading improvement plan. 
So most uh, of the uh, students that fall in here, like I said, have to have that individual reading improvement plan. Uh, staff will work on building those with the uh, families. Um, that must be implemented no later than 30 days after the identification of the deficiency and must be created in con uh, consultation with the students, parents, guardians, principal, and other district identified staff. And parents and guardians must be provided with at least 10 progress updates throughout the year for the students that um, have uh, been identified as having a deficiency on the literacy screen. In demonstrating reading deficiencies, uh, any time during the school year, if a student in K3 demonstrates a reading deficiency, uh, parents and guardians must be notified, like I said, no later than 15 days after that identification. And making sure that um, you know within 30 days of identification, uh, the develop, uh, developed and described interventions and services available, so they have that information. And then the students in grades three should demonstrate sufficient reading skills to progress to grade four unless the student receives a waiver. And so any student that's still uh, demonstrating a reading deficiency at the end of grade three uh, will be recommended for retention and to move forward will have to have a uh, waiver from a parent. Uh, and that'll be a conversation that will happen and it really talks to the progression um, of the students. And, as we go through and we look at the students progressing through working closely with parents and having those conversations, you know, kindergarten through second grade and into third grade, those students that are at third grade it should demonstrate uh, sufficient reading skills to progress to grade four by scoring at grade level on the literacy screening tool um, or the statewide summative assessment or on an alternative assessment approved by the Department of Education. Um, but one of the things that as we look at working and working with families to make sure they're progressing on, there is that conversation about retention. And so it's important to note that when we talk about retention, that the retention is determined based on the spring screening, uh, that a student in third grade has a demonstrated reading deficiency and the student does not demonstrate that sufficient reading skills to progress to fourth grade. Uh, a meeting must be scheduled with the parent guardian no less than 45 days before the end of the school year to discuss retention. Um, if the parent decides, and of course this is a conversation that the teachers and the principal we're having with the parents working in, in consultation with, um, if the parent decides that they want their child to progress to fourth grade, um, then they must sign a waiver developed by the Department of Education acknowledging that the student um, was not prepared for fourth grade and that the student will be participating in additional 20 hours of individual reading and intervention services over the summer. And so that is required for any student that has a waiver and is wanting to progress on to fourth grade. This is just a general quick breakdown of the fundamental principles of the Alaska Reads Act and the process as we look at the literacy screener. They'll take place in fall, winter, and spring. Uh, based on the results of the literacy screener, they'll have the individual learning improvement plans for the students. Uh, so the student will enter that MTSS process. And then the intervention and monitoring as staff and teachers are monitoring, as well as the support staff that are supporting the teachers around Alaska Reads Act. Uh, um, they'll be uh, communicating with parents, uh, monitoring the progress, and making adjustments to those individual reading improvement plans that are required for students. Uh, that. Um, demonstrated deficiency in, uh, that is of course under that 40th percentile on the uh, M-Class literacy screener. And then at the end of the year meeting, 45 days before the last school day, uh, they'll have to have that end of the year meeting and discussions uh, with the um, parents uh, about, you know, what's going to happen about retention or moving forward. How the district is preparing for Alaska Reads Act. Uh, we are currently participating in the Alaska MTSS refresh project. Um, part of that process is going through looking at our multi-tiered systems and supports across the district and in each of our buildings and supporting our students and supporting our staff uh, with our MTSS practices. Uh, in addition, we're researching supplemental programs recommended by the state uh, to help support um, our students' um, interventions, tier two, tier three, uh, in addition to, we have a number of staff that um, are attended one, the RTI MTSS conference that took place, as well as we'll be attending the Science of Reading Symposium later this month um, for additional support in the development of that multi-tiered system of support plan. Um, again, we did adopt, the district is going to adopt the statewide literacy screening M class by Amplify, which is uh, DIBLES 8. Uh, in addition, uh, the um, 
district, and we're going to have somebody speak on that shortly. Ms. Barry's going to speak on that shortly, adopting a research-based English language arts curriculum. So we're looking at a process of reviewing the English language arts curriculum and looking at options uh, based on the principles of the science of reading. And so the timeline that we're looking at right now is um, fall of 2023, uh, looking at um, selecting a curriculum to pilot, and I think that should actually say spring of 2023. I apologize on that, that's a mistype. Um, and then January 2024, the board is looking to adopt uh, a well, we're looking at uh, piloting, so in fall of 2023, we're talking right now and gonna be looking at some different curriculums to um, pilot for fall of 2023 and talking to the board, um, and then looking at adopting in January. So having some curriculum to look at, potentially pilot in the fall, and then adopt in January. So in the spring, we can focus on professional development for staff to make sure they have the uh, professional development around uh, the uh, English language arts curriculum, K-5, that lines up with the science of reading. And so uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. And then uh, one of the things we're also doing right now is providing professional development opportunities based on the science of reading. And ultimately, why is this important? And I think we all know the ability to read is a predictor of lifelong success, as well as a strong reading program gives students the best chance to maximize their education. And what we also often say when we're having and talking about students, pre-K to third grade, they learn to read, but fourth grade and beyond, they read to learn. And so students who don't have a full understanding of reading at grade level um, are at a disadvantage in uh, their success in class and so that is the main focus of why we're going to be um, you know really putting a lot of effort and support and you know working with Alaska Reads Act. At this point I'd like to invite Ms. Barry to come up. She's going to talk a little bit about the English language arts curriculum review process that we have going on right now. Hello again. So um, we um, per the Alaska Reads Act we've been looking at the Department of Education's list of tier one resources and tier two and three resources. Uh, for the tier two and three curriculum, we're currently using about half of the recommended uh, supports, um, currently between Baranoff and Keats. Um, but as we were looking, there were, um, you know, and of course the programs are uh, looking at the science of reading, um, making sure that the programs provide, um, you know, promote that approach, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, so currently we have a group of uh, 12 members for our uh, ELA curriculum review. We met last week and we have another meeting this, this Friday. Um, the group is made up of, um, of course, our administrators, our principals in both Heat and Baranoff, as well as our reading interventionists at both buildings, um, our cultural director, Ms. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, and then also we have parent representation along with um, a teacher representative from each grade level K-5. Um, and so basically through this process, we're going to be looking at the seven different programs um, that the Department of Ed is recommending. Again, if it's not required, but looking at those programs that they've already researched and you know, vetted as being uh, the appropriate uh, approach to support the S, you know, science of reading. Um, and so we have samples on the way, and there's many options to be looking at the samples online as well. So as a committee, we'll be looking at the samples, providing samples to grade level teams so that they can review it and give input back, um, share it with the teams, report back, and then we're, our goal is to decide by May next board meeting um, which program or programs we would like to pilot in the fall, and um, depending on building needs um, and of course developmentally appropriateness um, of, of the curriculum. So uh, I think that's probably um, good. So the science of reading, um, I just wanted to explain that a little bit. It's really a framework that revolves around explicit direct instruction on all of the components of reading, which are phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And we're, as we take a look at our tier one, we have a lot of those components, but not all of them. And it's not explicit enough. So hence the reason why we want to look at our tier one instruction, which if you think of tier one is going to be what you teach all of your class. And so the hope is that 80% of your students are going to receive that information to be able to go with it. Then our other 20% um, breaking down in tier two and three, that's when you need to supplement with additional interventions. Um, so in the basic model of reading the, if you go back to that one, sorry. Um, so read, in order to understand or comprehend what we read, we really have to have the decoding, which is the foundational skills, the phonemic awareness, phonics, 
um, and in addition to the language comprehension in order to be able to process and read. We're learning a lot about how our, brain, our children's brains work and how um, that tends the science of reading. So, um, you know, basically how kids learn. And so we're going to try to get our curriculum in line with that to really support um, all of our students. And then um, for our Title I and II federal programming, um, the Title I funding uh, is to support students to receive equitable access um, to, ac uh, to education. So a lot of our, well, our intervention programs, um, our interventionists, both at uh, Blatchley, Keat, and Baranoff have in the past been funded half by uh, Title I funds. And then Title II um, funds is really to support teacher preparation. And so as we move forward, really thinking about how we can utilize the uh, or Title II funding to support our, our teacher preparedness, making sure that they have the, the supports for the professional development that ties in with whatever curriculum it is that we um, do decide to um, go with. So um, on the DEEP website, they have the list of the core programs uh, that are all there. The bottom one is really directed, the seventh one open up to uh, EL is really more directed for our English learners. Um, so it may not be as directly applicable to our, our students, um, some of our students, but not for a tier one um, setting. So we're gonna be looking at all of these programs um, and, and that's the com comprehensive list that the state has already looked into. So basing our decision hopefully off of this information and, and choosing the best program or programs that work for our two buildings. Thank you very, thank you very much, I know, for filling that in. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a couple more slides, but I didn't know if we want to take a moment if there's any questions specifically uh, from Ms. Berry around the um, conversations that are starting with curriculum review and looking at some of the curriculum that might be out there uh, to come forward to the board and talk about, you know, maybe some next steps on piloting a couple of options across the district. Um, I'd like to jump in and say I'm looking forward to learning more about the um, what curriculum we will be reviewing and moving towards choosing the different piloting um, programs that you stated. Um, when I do have a question about when a child is identified as needing intervention, will that coincide with uh, their IEP or will that, how will that work? So it's kind of apples and oranges. So there's um, they will fall within. They could potentially fall within the two, you know, the red and yellow categories. Um, but as long as we are um, working and uh, having their individual plan, if they already have an IEP, I believe that um, they don't need the IR IP, the <laughs> individualized reading plan. So many acronyms. Um, but I'm, is that correct? Yeah. So. They will still be receiving all of their services. They probably will fall within the red and yellow category. However, it's all of the students who aren't currently receiving interventions that will be the ones that will need the individualized reading plan. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Board, do you have any questions? So perhaps there's going to be a lot of interventions. Who's going to provide? That is a wonderful question, and I think that that is going to be that was going to be my answer or my <laughs> answer to Felix's question. Um, that is a huge concern because currently uh, we're looking at if we were to look, and uh, it's hard to compare because it's going to be a different screener specifically at Heat than we're currently using. But by using the current screeners that we're, we have at Heat, if we were to serve all of the students that fell into the red and orange category, and our our we it would be. Um, 47 students um, that would all need individualized reading plans and also they have to be contacted within the 15 days and then be provided the services. We currently have one reading interventionist at Keats, um, one full-time reading interventionist and also at Baranoff. So there's absolutely no way that those one interventionists are going to be able to cover all of the, in the meetings alone that are going to be required to, for those individualized reading plans the, the time there's it's not we're not gonna we're gonna have to get really creative but it's going to be very difficult 
Well, I would like to add on to that. I mean, that's part of what we talk about, the supports, talk about the professional development. Part of that is how do we put together the individual reading intervention plans? How do we do so um, to effectively meet the needs of the students? But finding the time, because obviously it's working with parents, contacting parents, notifying them, because we also have to give, as the student is identified as having a deficiency in reading, we have to have those notifications, you know, throughout the year, you know, depending on when they're identified, you know, up to potentially 10 times throughout the year having those conversations. A lot of those conversations are going to happen towards the end of the day, you know, maybe during prep time, during breaks, maybe before school, but some of those meetings, some of those interventions that we have to have in place for students are going to have, most likely have to happen after school. And so looking at identifying resources to go towards that, and we've been looking at just taking some of those estimate numbers, trying to say, okay, if we are communicating with each student, um, they're with each family uh, once in, say, an hour a week or an hour every couple of weeks, what would that look like for each classroom, for each teacher, and what would the commitment be? And that would be some of the conversations we have uh, during the budget work session of, you know, do we expand out the literacy support coordinator, which right now is you know in that role, but potentially look at increasing um, and changing uh, one of the positions to a um, position that is almost Alaska Reads support, um, and finding some you know ways to expand that support for staff because there will need to be additional support for staff to help, especially with the implementation right at the very beginning of um, the school year as we start identifying students uh, through the M-Class Literacy Screener and getting better ideas of what those numbers might look like. And um, it's good to hear about um, how we're going to um, work out how our educators are going to be, um, you know, informed. How are you going to work with our parents um, in educating them on what is coming up and how to identify and work with their um, child's educator in school? That is a great question. Um, one of the big things we'll be talking about at the beginning of the year is, you know, what is the Alaska Reads Act? Getting information on the family, you know, talking about it at the board meeting, starting to notify families about uh, what the requirements around the Alaska Reads Act are, as well as working with um, you know, the staff to be able to have those conversations, uh, talk with families at open houses when they come back at the beginning of the school year, outlining what that uh, Alaska Reads Act mean, what the literacy screeners mean, and just have some of those resources available for them as we start working through the process, just as a holistic conversation around it. And then as we start looking at having the um, M class screener that takes place, identifying the students, and then start having those individual conversations with our families about you know um, what that means for their students if they're in kindergarten and if they're in third grade. Because obviously, if they're in third grade, there is that question about what that transition and that progression is going to look like for that student to move on to fourth grade as we get through the end of the year. And so, it's going to be a multi approach with you know starting to have conversations like now talking about the Alaska Reads Act, but also um, really trying to inform families at the beginning of the year what what does this process look like, what does this mean, how are we going to, how is the Alaska Reads Act as implemented by the City School District going to support um, the students, support the families to work through, um, you know, to try to get those students up to grade level reading. I think this question is, is for the public's benefit um, to fully kind of understand what we're talking about in terms of the scope and magnitude of what we're going to have to be able to provide and I'm just wondering if you can speak to the percentage of students in the district currently k through three who would require intervention services so the reading plan additional meetings with parents and families additional intervention services all of that Right now, when you look at the numbers, um, again, uh, Ms. Barry kind of talked to this, it's kind of a little bit apples and oranges with the way that we test right now, but our, our initial estimates as we're looking at it is about 40 to 50 percent of our students, K through three, um, would fall in that below the 40th percentile, which would, you know, essentially be identified as uh, needing an individualized reading intervention plan um, and that additional support. And so, um, until we actually roll out the M-Class literacy screener, um, it's going to be hard to say exactly what that's going to look like. But you know that uh, about 40% of our students at that grade, at kindergarten through third grade. And so, again, when you look at what that looks like in our classrooms, 40% of each classroom, you know, kindergarten through third grade, you're looking at uh, oh my gosh, 
much time to do math right here on the spot, but you figure 16 to 20, you know, that is, you know, looking at eight students out of 20 and, you know, a little bit less for that potentially in each class. And so it, it is going to take additional time for teachers. And those are, the, those are the things that we need to work on and think about and how do we provide those supports for staff to make sure. And that support not only with professional development for, you know, being, being able to efficiently process through and effectively address through the individual reading intervention plans the needs of the students, working with the parents about what that um, plan is going to look like, and then also making sure that those additional supports after school are provided for those students uh, because there are going to be some requirements after school as well to support students. And so um, we'll, we're, we're looking at costing right now. We've been doing some initial um, kind of estimates of what that cost might look like. But the thing that is hard to say is you don't really know what that's going to be until we start identifying and, and knowing the students, knowing what the needs are and what the full scope of the Alaska Reads Act is going to require from districts. And so we've got some numbers. Um, but it's hard to, I mean, it's, it, it, can, it can fluctuate pretty, pretty drastically depending on, you know, what those needs might look like. And until we actually start going through and doing the assessments, you know, we're, we're estimating around potentially 40% of our students. Mindy, did you want to add a little bit more to that? Too? Yeah, I, think, I think you hit it. Um, you know, they're really, and then of course, these are for, this is our current K-3. We don't know what it's going to look like for our incoming kindergartners next year and as those kids go up. So that's going to be also um, just an unknown for us right now as well. I just think that's important for the, the public to be aware of, for parents to be aware of, and I mean, everybody, especially when we're talking about the base student allocation and education funding, now that, you know, that one-time funding's out again. I mean, we're talking about, what, 150 kids who are going to require significant intervention services without really having much additional revenue to, to do that. So I think it's just important to keep in mind. Yeah, I'm going to ask a, more, a couple more questions along that line. Um, okay. We want, as a, commu as a community, you know, a school district to get this right, make sure that we are able to do this fully to the extent where we can get every single student to grade level by grade three. Realistically, how many more positions, how much more funding outside of the Ninety thousand dollars that we might be getting getting through the funding, more is needed to be able to have a district like ours do this properly, because I think right now there's a larger statewide conversation about whether or not this is an unfunded unfunded mandate, and being able to be equipped with that knowledge, personally, as I go to a state board meeting in a couple of weeks to talk more about this, um, would be great for me. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to address as best I can. I kind of talked a little bit to when um, Mr. Gavin had asked the question too. It's it's hard to put an exact number on it yet because we just don't have the full scope of what the needs are going to be. Um, we know that we're going to have a need for after school supports. We know we're going to have to have additional time for staff and for teachers kindergarten through third grade to be able to have the training that is going to be required as part of the Alaska Reads Act, because every single teacher has to be certified in science and reading. Um, you know, and we just, I want to say it was towards the middle of the end of the last week, got the first state-sponsored science and reading training um, you know, program that came out that staff can start signing up for. And so we shared that with our uh, principals who are working with staff to share that. Um, but that's not just an hour of training. That's multiple days of training. It is hours of training. And so one of the things that we're going to be looking at is putting together our professional development, professional learning plan to provide those supports for the staff. And that's where using uh, the tier uh, Title II uh, professional development funds will help. And so um, that will be funding that will go towards the professional development and supporting staff. But as we step back and we look at, um, there's a lot of different factors that come into place. If you're just looking at the hours, you know, you could, some rough numbers, and these are rough numbers, and so um, potentially anywhere from $220,000, $250,000 to $400,000, depending on what those needs might be. If you add on staff costs, if we add an interventionist, 
um, to help support that. Whether it's a full time, we have two uh, interventionists, one at uh, Keat, one at um, Baranoff, as well as the Learning Support Coordinator right now, which um, is funded through CARES funding and will be going away from that support for CARES funding. If you add on additional staff to that, that's for each staff member, that's approximately $110,000. And so you can see where if you provide the staff support to help with the implementation to support the teachers who are trying to support the students in the development of the individualized reading intervention plans, as you start having those supports in place, you start looking at numbers potentially over the 500000 even going into $600,000. Um, again, these are rough numbers. It's hard to really know what those supports might have to look like. Um, you know, in looking at if we have to provide some extra duty time after school, so many hours a week to support staff. Um, you know, it's until we go through and start identifying the students what those supports are going to look like. Those are rough numbers uh, that we've um, that I've been looking at uh, to as far as what we're kind of potentially looking at, the costing for supporting the Alaska Reads Act. And you were correct in that number, I think the $30 BSA increase that the district will realize uh, in that transition to FY23 to FY24 with the BSA increase equates to a little over $90,000 for the district. Thank you for that. I, I also just wanted to address the fact that, you know, is it, first, I have first question, is Deed saying that 40% is proficient? Is that what they're, they've established as the proficiency level? Yeah, so through the M class, through the uh, literacy screener, that is that is because for students that score above the 40%, that is determined as they're proficient. Anyone that scores below the 40th percentile um, is identified as having a deficiency in reading. Okay, follow up to that. Those students in that middle percentile, you know, 40 to 60, 70, you know, are still most likely struggling with reading. You know, what extra, despite the students that we're all gonna have to do all this, with all, all and it's so many, you know, you know, a lot of these kids, even if they're proficient by that standard, are still gonna be struggling with reading, and re realistically in that 40%, 50% range. And so what extra support can we, provide to them as well. Which is that is a great question. And so I'll start and then kind of see, you have an idea, you might want to answer this as well. So what I will say is one of the things that when we look at supporting students, you know, we just, at least as we support students, you address individual student needs as you're kind of looking at that, whether they score above the 40th percentile, below the 40th percentile. That ties to the MTSS plan that we're talking about. And so in, in when we talk about that multi-tiered system of support and that tier one, which is kind of your universal instruction, your tier two um, supports, um, and then your tier three kind of intensive supports for students. Depending on the needs of the students, as they're kind of working through and, and the staff and the teachers are identifying what those needs might be, you might have a student that is in that 41%, let's say, and they might need some tier two. In most instances, their tier one universal instruction is taking place, regular classroom instruction, but they might have some specific tier two intervention needs that are in place and the teacher can work with you know, them to make sure that those supports are in place. And so that's one of the nice models with that multi-tier system of support is as student needs are identified, there are different options to be able to provide some of those intensive supports or those interventions to support the students. And did you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, yeah, so like what that would look like in a classroom is if you have, you're giving your tier one instruction to all of the class and you notice whether it's reading, math, or even you know social, emotional, their behaviors, you're looking at kids who need additional supports and you would give the tier two support in class with the uh, supplemental um, resources that we have. At Keat, we have a resource room um, that is my room that has, where teachers can come and say, I have a kiddo who really needs more work in vocabulary, and they, can, you know, they know where the vocabulary section is, or fluency, additional fluency practice. We have a lot of those supplemental su uh, supports in place for the classroom teachers so that they can utilize those in the classroom to be able to differ differentiate and uh, their instruction and, and really support those, those students. I don't want to add on to the anxiety um, or the thought of this coming up, and I, I really do appreciate your everyone's um, work um, going into how to how to figure out the scope and what is needed to 
uh, complete this task that is put upon us. Um, with hearing the, um, the required after school programming, I do um, worry about equity and um, how are we going to provide those services to um, children and families who may not have the resources to be able to pick their children up or to be able to bring them to the required after school programming that is needed for their child. So that's going to be something that we're probably going to talk about as this rolls out and um, you know, thank you for the information. Is there anything else from the board? Mr. Gabel? Felix's question about how much money it would take kind of prompted me to do some quick Googling. Because um, when we were when we were over uh, in Juneau for the legislative fly-in at the, um, the Alaska Administrators um, Council meeting, there, um, there are other states that have done this in the past. Colorado is one of them. Um, we happen to be sitting with a superintendent who had gone through that experience in Colorado. Um, so I just did a quick Google of their um, upcoming or their current FY, their current fiscal year budget in, in Colorado, in addition to you know statewide resources for curriculum, for professional development, for testing, for all of those things, Colorado provides a per pupil um, amount of funding. And for this fiscal year, it was $524 per pupil for each student who would qualify for, for reading and intervention services. Um, you know, so compare that to kind of what, what our state is allocating. And in, in Colorado, um, the average I looked at here for the percentage of students um, who were classified in that category is 15%. You know, so there it was 15% of $524. Here we're talking about potentially 40% of our students and you know a BSA increase of $30. So. Thank you, is there anything else? Just got more. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Thank you. Just to finish up my slides, uh, I just wanted to take a moment. Um, I just wanted to update uh, on the search. As you heard, uh, Principal Demmer is retiring. Uh, and so wanted to just update the search on the new Kikushini principal. Uh, we have received um, applications on that position and they have uh, closed, uh, last Friday they closed. Uh, the district already has a long-standing administrative regulation on the books that lays out the hiring process. Uh, this administration, administrative regulation was first implemented back in 1998 and was last revised in 2007. And so just wanted to update the board. The next step set forth in the regulation is for the district to form an interview committee. And this committee shall consist of at least the following, uh, a principal or director, one current employee of the relevant department, one parent, one representative of the native community, and a district office representative. Uh, the committee will interview the applicants and recommend a candidate to the superintendent. The committee will make that recommendation uh, that when it comes to the superintendent, and if the superintendent uh, selects and approves the candidate, then an offer is uh, made, uh, of course, subject to board approval. If the candidate declines the offer, the superintendent rejects the committee's recommendation, the committee is asked for another recommendation. Um, so that's just kind of the process uh, for the longstanding regulation and you know we're going to be um, you know we've polled staff at Kikushin to find out what are the characteristics that you would like to see in the next principal for Kikushin and we are going to be putting out a parent uh, family uh, survey as well asking some of the questions so when the interview committee forms they can have the feedback from not only the staff but also from the um, parents about what they're looking for in the next principal at Kikushin. So, uh, Mr. Demers leaving big shoes to fill so um, you know we just want to make sure that the hiring of a principal at a school is probably one of the most important things as a superintendent uh, we can do and as a school community um, the building administrator is very important to the overall running of the school and the support of the school and the staff that are in that school. And so it's an important process and we want to make sure we get plenty of feedback um, to make sure that process is done uh, to the best that we can. Get the right person in there that's going to meet the needs of the kids and the families in the community. So uh, I would say for the families, uh, if you're a key parent, uh, keep your eyes open for the survey. Uh, we definitely want to get your input. 
And then lastly, uh, we do have this week, uh, Sika School District started administering statewide assessments, AK STAR and Alaska Science Assessment to students grade three through 10. So far, testing has gone well. Like I said, we've had a couple technology hiccups, but quite honestly, it's been going pretty smooth. Um, and so we finished up access testing and we'll be getting that uh, sent in uh, before tomorrow. And uh, the um, schools that are testing this week is Sika High School and Blasio Middle School. And next week, Kushini and Pacific High School will be testing. And so it's going well, and we're excited about that for getting the Alaska Stars and AK Star and Alaska Science Assessment. And just a couple of other announcements. Budget work session on Thursday, April 13th. The budget hearing and adoption will be Thursday, April 20th. That is of the budget. And on April 21st, Friday, there's no school because of the teacher and service day. And with that, that concludes my superintendent's report. Mr. Hauser, um, going back to the hiring of the principal of um, Kiku Shaheen, what's the timeline for that? Timeline for that is uh, we have just started forming the committee. Uh, the committee is going to get together. We have a uh, set number of questions, but we want to get based on the input from the um, community and from the staff. What we'd like to do is bring the uh, community together to talk about and form some specific questions to meet the interests of the parents and of the staff uh, for those questions that we asked of the uh, uh, principal candidates and so we'll probably start pulling that community together and having those conversations and developing questions uh, we'll be reaching out to uh, candidates to set up uh, initial screening interviews and interviews for the uh, candidates with the committee um, what my hope is to get the uh, parent survey out uh, before the end of this week uh, collect that and hopefully start interviewing within the next week and a half two weeks so that's the goal, and then making a final determination when the committee, you know, convenes and moves forward a recommendation. Thank you for that. Board, do you have any questions? All right. Thank you. How are we doing? Do we have to just wanted to check. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to. Thank you for the summer. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, thank you. Um, moving on to item 13, new business. 13A, approval of resolution in support of increasing the base student allocation. Make it a motion to approve the resolution in support of increasing the base student allocation. And before that, Mr. Gavon, do you want to touch a little bit more about this? You, we're very thankful that you put um, time and your dedication into writing this. I do want to give you time to Let's do it before. Um, so, so I brought this resolution forward. Um, you know, the title is that the school, Sika School District strongly urges the Alaska State Legislature to increase the base student allocation in fiscal year 24. And so, um, you know, just all of the conversation, we've talked about it so much over the last several months you know, in terms of the need for increased school funding and the situation with the base student allocation or BSA, you know, and will it increase, will it not? And, you know, just all these, yeah, just just all of the uncertainty around that and, and what next year's budget's gonna look like. And so um, one of my goals in bringing this forward, you know, first is to, to have a, a resolution specifically from the Sika School Board um, that we can all speak to and that we can all present and send to our to our legislators and, and to the legislature. Um, if this passes tonight, I also plan to bring this to uh, STA Tribal Council and the City Assembly um, to, to urge them to pass a similar resolution so that we can show some unified support from Sika's governments that, that this is really important and critical to us, um, the school district has this as a legislative priority. So does STA Tribal Council for STA, the increase um, in the BSA. And so just wanted to, to bring this forward. I think one other kind of thing I wanted to note on this is that some of the language really focuses around the idea of inflation proofing the BSA. Because oftentimes I, there's a narrative that school districts are just asking for more money. Right, we just want more and more money. And I think it's really important to, to emphasize that that's not what we're asking for. We're asking for education funding to keep up with inflation, basically. 
Um, you know, so there's some statistics in here that I've, you know, set at this table before. I think one of the, the ones that really stands out to me is that, you know, since the, the last DSA increase, which would be uh, July 1st, 2016, um, you know, that $30 increase amounts to 0 0.5, a half a percent increase in the BSA. And in that same time period, inflation, according to the consumer price index, is 25%. You know, so we've had an increase of funding of half a percent when inflation has, has been 25%, and about 17% or a little more just since March of, of 2020. So again, just think this is important to, to keep on the legislature's radar, you know, especially what we, we just heard tonight that they've removed that funding, and it was only one-time funding. So I think that's important because one-time funding means we're back here doing the same thing next year. Um, so, anyways, that's that's why this is coming forward, and hopefully some unified pressure from our governments, from you know SEA, from SESPA, from NEA, from all of our parents, families, community, just kind of keep that pressure up on the state legislature. Thank you for that, and thank you again for putting the time into um, creating this resolution and for um, your continuing advocacy on this matter. That being said, uh, is there a motion to approve the resolution in support of increasing the base student allocation? I move to approve the resolution in support of increasing the base student allocation. Is there a second? I second that. It's been moved and seconded to approve the resolution in support of increasing the base student allocation. Is there any opposition? Questions? Discussion? Sure. Um, yes, thank you for um, writing this up, um, Tristan. I guess I'm just wondering if we can add, maybe I'm not seeing it, the current BSA, can we put that amount in there? I think we could probably, I feel like there's a natural place in the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh, whereas the BSA would need to be 7,413 in February 2023, or almost 25% higher than the current 5,960 BSA to keep up with inflation. Thank you. And then the other thing I just wanted to clarify is on Oh, where is it? Um, the Sitka School District is facing the prospect of having to lay out 15 teachers. Um, I thought it was going to be 17 if we're going to hire an assistant superintendent. So I'm just wondering if that 15 is still the correct number. So right now, based on the budget deficit that we have, it is 15 through the budget process. If we were to add an assistant superintendent, that would go up to 17. And so I guess it's a matter of, before we develop the budget, do we say we have to potentially, you know, uh, reduce 17 or through the process, we create the budget around. So based on the budget right now, um, we can make that adjustment. I guess that's a question for the board as we go through, we look at that development of the, the budget. Um, you know, and what those priorities are for adding the assistant superintendent and what that impact might be for putting those numbers in there. So it's until we actually go through and develop that and say, here's what the budget proposal is going to be with the assistant superintendent, then that potentially could have an impact on 17 teachers versus 15 teachers. And just one thing here, because to, to me, the percentage of the district's overall teaching staff is the number that I think to me really yeah, this catches attention, 14%. So if we did put 17 teachers, that would be just under 16%. It would be like 15.7%. So just in terms of information, I don't have strong feelings over either way. I think if we're going for impact, I would like to have that in mind. Any other board discussion? Any public comment? No, I should have taken my own break. And I offered it. Yeah, I did. Sorry.
Mr. Myers. I just want to say that this is incredible and, and I'm so grateful that we're doing this and putting together this resolution. I do want to say though that the more amount of support, the more letters sent, the more calls put in amounts to more of an effect. And so as a community, as people who care about education, care about our kids and making sure that they have the best education possible, everyone who is who can needs to take, you know, might only take, you know, 15, 20 minutes to put together an email saying, I support this bill, please, I beg you, increase the BSA because the damage across the state and it's untold if this doesn't happen. And so, you know, we as a community and as people as of this state need to come together on this and everyone needs to do their part or else, you know, with all the uncertainty and with everything going on with the budget, it, I, it very well could not, it might not happen. And so we need to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen because it will be catastrophic. So please, everyone, do something. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Anyone else? Seeing none. It's been moved and seconded um, to approve the resolution in support of increasing the base student allocation. Is there any opposition? Motion passes. Moving on to item 13B, Stacy Golden, update on elementary science curriculum. Welcome. So I was last here in February to talk to you guys about the work the Science Committee was doing. Um, the K-5 teams looked at um, their two different options that they chose, so Generation Genius and Mystery Science. Then um, after exploring those for a month, we met back um, and each grade um, gave us a synopsis on what their team determined, what they liked, positives, negatives of both. Um, and made a decision that they want to go ahead and just keep working with Mystery Science. Um, and I say keep working with Mystery Science because they've been using it in the district for um, a while. Um, different teachers have been using it. It's something that's not new to the district, but it was a, kind of a supplemental thing. Um, I believe Ms. Hemshute um, even used it several years ago when she was still teaching science in the district. So it's been around. It's nothing that's new, but the, the piece moving forward would be that it would be used at all grades, K through five. So it would become more widely implemented um, and give that consistency and that flow. It is part of um, Discovery Education. It's one of their resources that they make um, and create and utilize. Um, the couple of really great things are that um, Mr. Hauser has already moving forward with all of the stuff to get the mystery packs here. Um, so mystery packs are um, kits, essentially what it is, and one kit takes care of 30 students for the year. And the committee spent a lot of time going back and forth because sometimes kits like this can be super helpful and great resources, sometimes there can be a lot of waste that goes along with them. Um, but after kind of exploring it a bit, the idea is to move forward with each grade level will have their packs for the year. They um, then teams will look and see, is it, is it a good fit to use the PACs or would we be better off and be more fiscally responsible to come up with our own list of what we need and order stuff moving forward. Um, but for, especially with the transition of re-implementing um, this level of science across um, the K-5 curriculum, giving them the option to start with these mystery PACs. So those should be here for them to use in the fall. And um, then they have the 421 in service this year to look at um, kind of what they're want, they want to do with it. Some grades and some teachers have more exposure to mystery science than other teachers and other grades. So give them time to start looking at that, uh, laying out a scope and sequence, seeing where their 
collaboration with community partners fits into um, what the plan is and using uh, the mystery science curriculum. Um, as far as secondary stuff goes, Blatchley and Sika High, we're just going to keep working on developing our own curriculum. We don't want to buy any specialized curriculum kits that are out there. Um, Pacific High is exploring um, curriculum options and um, will let us know kind of this month <laughs> if they have found a curriculum set that they want to use to look at getting for Pacific High and then we would come back next month um, if that was the case and talk to you guys about that um, and kind of look forward with that. Um, the main thing that the secondary schools really need um, it kind of comes back to the discussion that you were just having and that's the idea of like cost and expense of, you know, um, our principals are fantastic at trying to get us all the extra funds that they can to help with materials, but science is about consumables. You know, beakers get broken, chemicals get used. Um, and so really, the, the secondary groups would really love to see if at the, um, at the higher level, money could be set aside to help for consumables in science education because we get the same amount that every other curriculum gets. Um, but like I said, every principal at every school is fantastic at saying, I have a little extra money, how can I help support the science department? But just our needs are high in terms of finances and that's a big challenge. So that's one thing um, people would like to see. And then looking forward to next year, um, really the thing is we've spent so much time looking at this that we haven't developed like a scope and sequence document. Um, so that hasn't been updated, I think, 2011 or 2013. So our big initial goal would be able to say, this is the scope and sequence, where all the standards fit, what the units are like, this is where our different units um, go with our collaborators um, in the community. We haven't even gotten <laughs> to those documents yet or looking at that. Um, you know, in, like, for instance, at the high school, we did those and we've updated them with the new standards, but we don't have like official, like nice documents that we could show or share. We all know what we're doing and we know how we have them divided out. But looking at that, moving forward to next year, we really need just time to work on those curriculum pieces and lay them out. Um, and I know that was a big goal of Mr. Hauser's and I would imagine Mr. Bradshaw will want to continue um, that role. Um, and so that was something we had talked about and looked forward to um, in just that time. So that's kind of where we are um, with that. So I don't know what questions you have for me or clarifications you need. Any questions for Mr. Kama? Yeah, I just, I just have a question around community involvement in the process, and I wonder if you could speak to um, kind of throughout this process how um, students have been involved, and then parents and guardians, and then some of our you know key partners, uh, the Science Center, STA. Um, see Alaska Heritage who's funding you know about I think three positions in the sciences um, within the district now and then just community at large. So for this there hasn't been when the committee was established in the fall it was just starting with or no not in the fall last year um, it was just to get the ball kind of rolling and so it has stayed um, as just teachers in that realm and then because there was a, a new curriculum like being adopted or purchased or anything. We didn't head down the route of having family nights or anything because mystery science is already being used in the district. So it hasn't been, um, this has been more, I think, correct me if I phrase this wrong, Mr. Hauser, but essentially this has come from a place of interest of teachers of wanting to help support the elementary teachers get back in and then with the loss of the position at the elementary school, it's been us trying to scrounge and how to help and get this rolling, um, opposed to we haven't really had like an extremely formal process. It's been more or less like, this is what we've done, and then I get a hold of him, and I'm like, where should we go forward? And So we've kind of just built this thing along, opposed to having a big formalized community-wide curriculum, and we didn't get tons of samples, and um, you know, kind of started out as a Band-Aid to help cover some of the cuts and stuff that have occurred. So. Yeah, I mean, and the scope and sequence would include, you know, all of those things that already happened down the road, and, um, but yeah, that's where we are with that. And, and also, I think one of the things is we were looking at um, the loss of that elementary science specialist, um, looking at the curriculum that was um, already in place with that mystery science and trying to support the staff as they were going through and start to 
integrate that into their classrooms more with the partnerships with um, with Seahawks, our uh, Six Sound Science Center and bring them in just like we saw with the volcano stuff, which I was watching the students do again today and working with um, some of the other uh, work that we're doing, especially at the middle school and the high school around the integration of the traditional ecological knowledge and our science curriculum for the life sciences for the 6th to 12th grade. Um, just trying to make sure that as we lost that elementary science specialist getting the curriculum that the staff was aware of, they knew it had been kind of being worked with and just trying to make sure that they have that transition so we can continue to provide um, that elementary science component uh, in the um, elementary school after that uh, loss of that science specialist. And that really has been the focus. We've, I mean, we've had little conversations about secondary stuff, but that really hasn't, it's been more, how do we help the elementaries? Um, and so there hasn't been deep discussions about secondary at all, and that's why we don't even have a scope and sequence updated or even laid out or <laughs> started, because it's just been, how do we help elementary move forward and what can we do for them? So. I appreciate appreciate the additional information and you know this is this is a comment um, at this point um, you know something for the board to consider and again back to the community and unfortunately things often come back to budgets but you know in the past one of the the things that the assistant superintendent would do would would be oversee curriculum reviews um, so I think you know we're seeing the impact of of eliminating that position with with kind of the comprehensiveness or the way we approach curriculum reviews and so you know I for one appreciate what staff are doing um, you know and, and trying to keep things going forward trying to ensure that we are doing those evaluations and we're having those conversations um, but again yeah this is this is one of the things with that position and with a little bit more funding we can do a much better job and um, you know I should say, have the resources to do the job, right? Just like the Reads Act or any of these kind of um, things we have to do. So again, appreciate the kind of extra duty or the you know out of out of love and just the necessity to ensure that kids get you know high quality education. Doing you know our educators or teachers doing what what they can. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that and thank you for that because that is literally like um, with when the, we last had assistant superintendents that was. One of the last things Sarah Frenzy said to me is, don't let the science work die. <laughs> and then, you know, things happened, you know, like a worldwide <laughs> pandemic and whatnot. Um, and so there's been a lot of transition. So I do appreciate you being cognizant of that. And I appreciate it. So thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much for that update. Yep. All right. Moving forward, um, item 13C, the formation of the school renaming committee. The board will appoint Superintendent Hauser to create a committee made up of stakeholders per AR 1332, naming of schools, facilities, fields, and other areas for the purpose of renaming Paranoff Elementary School. Is there a motion to appoint Superintendent Hauser to create a committee for the purpose of renaming Baranoff Elementary School for BP and AR 1332? I will move to appoint Superintendent Hauser to create a committee for the purpose of renaming Baranoff Elementary School per board policy and administrative regulation 1332. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to appoint Superintendent Hauser to create a committee for the purpose of renaming Baranoff Elementary School per BP and AR 1332. Is there any public comment? Any board discussion? Ms. Board? Um, I'm not sure when this happens. I just wanted to express my interest as a school board designee, if that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kava? I mean, I'd just like to say briefly that I'm really excited to, to see this moving forward. And, you know, a little um, 
sparked a little bit of joy saying the, the motion. So, um, you know, this is something that the school district and, and working with the tribe and others have been working on for a little while now. And so, again, just excited and appreciate the policy committee um, for working on developing this new policy we just passed this year. Um, you know, that really creates a, a comprehensive, well thought out process that engages, you know, a diverse um, group of folks. And so, again, just excited to see this move forward. Um, I would say that, you know, with the renaming of, of Baranoff Elementary, I hope the committee kind of keeps in mind that history and, um, you know, thinking about kind of, you know, in my mind, righting a wrong of, um, of naming an elementary school after, um, you know, the man who colonized uh, Chica, Sitka, um, you know, so keeping that in mind, and I, you know, would really like to see Tlingit language, um, you know, incorporated in this um, as part of that name, as a, as a recognition of, of that history and kind of writing that, that historical wrong. Mr. Myers? I just wanted to, you know, say thank you to everyone who's been putting work into this. I think it was, I think the first thing that ever was came up in my first policy meeting was about the, the naming and, and the policy to go towards this and who would be on that committee and everything. So um, to finally be at the point where we can actually establish that and get to work uh, is very exciting. And I look forward to whatever role I get to play in that process as well. So thank you. I would like to um, state that I, too, um, found some joy seeing this on the agenda this evening. Um, I do have to take a moment and appreciate the previous board who, um, when they heard of this, um, actually it was previous president, uh, Amy Morrison, who I um, contacted and brought um, the idea to, and she was like, well, I'm not going to say no, so she put it on the agenda. And I really do have to say that um, they were very brave to move forward with this. And you know, it just goes to show that over time, boards may change, people um, on the board may change, but the hard work and dedication of seeing something through, it really is um, why we do what we do. So moving forward, I'm excited to um, see this um, committee formed and to have the um, uh, community come together to, to um, come up with a, a new name for our school. Anyone else? All right. It's been moved and seconded to appoint Superintendent, Superintendent Hauser to create a committee for the purpose of renaming Baranoff Elementary School per BP and AR 1332. There's been offerings of public comment and board discussion. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, the motion passes. Moving on to item 13D, review of AR 0410 Title, no, Title IX Policy Administrative Regulation, adoption of the ASB model policy for the administrative regulation for Title IX. Did you want to speak to it? Since we are yeah, I just wanted to highlight um, the board and the consent agenda did approve the board policy around um, non-discrimination in district programs and activities, the Title IX uh, second reading board policy 0410. Um, this is the administrative regulation that kind of goes somewhat along with that in that the AR uh, around AR 0410 Title IX policy really speaks and outlines procedure um, in how it applies to the conduct defined as sexual harassment under Title IX and applicable federal regulations um, that meet that Title IX um, the jurisdictional requirements. And so um, the board policy that was passed earlier through the consent agenda, um, like I said, board policy 0410 is that non-discrimination 
um, policy that we have in place uh, for district programs and activities, including Title IX. But this AR that is the model policy um, speaks specifically to um, that procedure that applies to, like I said, uh, conducting uh, conduct that's just defined uh, through Title IX as sexual harassment. Just wanted to clarify that because sometimes that can it gets a little bit confusing with what does the board policy mean versus the Title IX you know policy because we talk about board policy being around non discrimination, but Title IX AR speaks to that. Um, procedures around uh, sexual harassment under Title IX. Is there any public comment to this review of AR 0410 Title IX policy administrative regulation? I wanted to add. Any board discussion? I do want to take a moment and thank our um, policy committee for their dedication in going over many of the policies and board um, and you know the review of this um, policy. Um, we spend an extensive amount of time on very different um, wording and uh, concepts and how um, discerning the effects of, you know, the different um, language that was put in. So my hat's off to the policy committee for their dedication. All right. The review has been completed. Moving on to item 14, future agenda items, upcoming events. 14A, April 6th, tomorrow. Um, there's a special meeting for executive session to finalize interim superintendent contract at 6 p.m. at the district office boardroom. Again, thank you, board, for your dedication in this endeavor. Um, it's exciting to get to this point and to move forward in this um, action. Item 14B, April 12th, 2023, policy committee meeting, 5 p.m. at the district office boardroom. Item 14C, April 13th, 2023, the budget work session at 6 p.m. at Harrigan Centennial Hall. Item 14B, April 17th, 2023, the special meeting for executive session, the superintendent evaluation, 5.30 in the district office boardroom. Item 14E, April 19, 2023, special meeting to fill vacant board seat, 6 p.m. district office boardroom. Hopefully we can uh, find someone to fill that spot. Um, I know that we all have reached out. Um, I've got to state that in my board report, but I, I feel I've talked to many people. Um, but I know we can come together and figure that out. Item 14F, April 20th, 2023, special, special meeting to speak about the final budget hearing and approval, 6 p.m. at the Sika High School Library. April is a full month for us. Um, so 14G, May uh, 3rd, 2023, the next regular school board meeting, 545 at Harrigan Centennial Hall. Uh, I feel that our next May um, meeting, we will have full board reports <laughs> <laughs> what we will be doing in April. Again, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we're coming up on adjournment. I adjourn this meeting at 8, 10 p.m. Thank you.